I don't think art can exist without science. Let's just face it, you know, they talk about STEM all the time, science, technology, engineering, and math, but truthfully, it's STEAM. You have to have the art in there. Stephanie Steelman, and I am a independent dyer and spinner here in Amarillo, Texas. I like to think I'm a little like Ben Franklin. I just have a multitude of jobs. So my full-time that pays the bills job is over at uh, CNS Pantex as a scientist. I've met so many people that were musicians and artists that once they saw chemistry, they're like, it's, it's musical or it's very art driven. So, so this all it combines together. I would never have told you that I was creative 20 years ago. I said, no, I'm a scientist. This is what I do. This is how I do. But tr typically you have to be artistic in order to think of crazy new ideas in research and development. You really do. So I think that has really shown me that I am a little bit artistic. Maybe I can't paint a, a picture and if I draw it's a stick figure, but I can put a palette of color onto yarn and make it look beautiful. I am an abstract artist. I um, mostly work in polymer clay mosaics, which is what you see behind me. Um, I love to tell a story or um, create um, a mood or record a period of time um, by assigning color to, uh, to different patterns and shapes in my, in my work. I'm Dawn Barker and I'm an artist. Probably as equally as long as I've known that I'm an artist, I've also been fascinated by fiber. Um, my grandmother, who is now in her 90s, just recently, she told me that when I was five, I came to her and demanded that she teach me to knit. I don't remember that, but she told she turned me away, and about two years later, I came back to her and showed her something else I had made and said, if I can do this, you can teach me to knit. And so she did. So I've been um, a, a knitter most of my life as well. Um, and so um, creating hand-dyed yarn was an easy step for me, to uh, an easy leap, I guess, because I could marry my love of color and color theory and color dynamics, the way colors work together, um, with my love of fiber. Another thing about me, I really love to bake. And so this, and then I was also a radiation therapist for many years and working in a hospital with cancer patients where you have to be very precise and accurate. And so accuracy was kind of built into my early DNA, I guess. And um, so dyeing for me is, is kind of a blend of a lot of different things that I've done in the past. My love of color, my love of precision. Um, so yes, when I create a, a new colorway, I will um, come up with what combination of dyes will work together to, to create that. Um, and then I record everything. I measure everything very carefully and I record it all in, in a little black book that I, my recipe book that I keep to, um, and then I eventually try to transcribe them so I have an electronic copy as well, but everything starts in the book. When we first started dyeing, a lot of the things that I read were like, take a teaspoon of this dye and a teaspoon of that. And in the scientific community, we work in grams and milliliters. And what I noticed was when I would look at like a yellow dye versus red, and I can show you this, a yellow dye versus a red dye, the molecules were different sizes. And you could tell by like, you would see the yellow is real fluffy and you'd see the red is real dense. Well, the red is a much smaller molecule than the yellow. And that was fascinating to me because I was like, oh, well, that means that if you have a smaller molecule and with wool, what happens is you have scales that lift up. And so the dye penetrates under those scales to change the color of the, the fiber. And what would ha when I was like going, oh, well, that means for red, you want it to strike fast. You're going to have to have it ready to strike. Your scales are going to have to be up. Whereas with yellow being a bigger molecule, you could do a slower strike. Is, I don't know if that's what we call it. Another thing that fascinated me is I can use all kinds of different types of acids. You can use weak acids, you can use strong acids, and it totally changes the color on the, the material. I mean, it, you can have, you can have a, aluminum sulfate, you can use that, or you can use citric acid, or you can use vinegar, and all three of those dye baths with the exact same amount of dye, with the exact same wool in there, will give you different colors. So there's a lot of chemistry that goes into it. You can, you can do natural dyeing, which you do mordant baths, and you actually have to use uh, things that will actually help the dye bind to the fiber if you use natural dyes. The dyes that we typically use are synthetic dyes, and they're called niolamine dyes. 
And so I actually went out and found the original paper on dyes and niolamines by a scientist that I think had it ordered through American Chemical Society. It was like $75 for like a 15 page article, but I wanted to totally understand the chemistry of these dyes before I got started. And so I drive my friends crazy because a lot of them are school teachers and English teachers and we read the same books, but they're like 70. We don't want to know about the molecule sizes. <laughs> Well, I, I do work in batches so that it's so the amount of time for one skein is, it sounds like a long time, but of course I don't just do one at a time, so that helps. But um, it needs to soak for a minimum, a minimum of a, at least at least a half an hour to uh, in, in citric acid and water to kind of open up the fibers and prepare it for the dye process. And then um, once it goes into the dye bath, it has to come up to a certain temperature. Um, in order for the dye to kind of soak into that yarn and that can depend on on the dye some dyes exhaust very quickly and other ones um, take a little longer but anywhere from you know ballpark half an hour um, and then uh, they get washed and rinsed um, spun to to spin out some of the excess water and then hung to dry the rest of the way and that is very much weather dependent how fast how quickly they dry um, if we're in a hurry, we put fans on them. <laughs> and then um, then that hank of yarn will get spun and twisted into a, a little skein and then labeled and, and it's ready ready to go to one of my stores. I would like to say that I'm kind of known for deeply saturated yarns. Um, I, I like to dye in a style called tonal yarns where you've got lots of different layers of color going on. Um, there are all sorts of different styles out there that other dyers dye. Um, but uh, from, I, I like to try to dye things that I would wanna use and that I would wanna ultimately wear. Um, and so that's where a lot of my inspiration comes from. Most of my colorways are not just one single dye. They're, they're layered in you know, combinations of, of different colors that I mix together. So. Um, a lot of dyers like me, a lot of indie dyers, um, get our supplies, our, our dye, from the same company. So it would be easy for me to just dye straight out of the jar and it would look a lot like what everybody else can do too. So in order to be different, I think it's important to um, try to mix things up and, and create your own. What comes into play though is, let, let's just say you want to mix red and blue and they're two different size molecules and you want a purple. If you don't understand what's going on in there, you may get red and blue splotches on your yarn versus purple dye that strikes the yarn at the exact same time. I would so love to take the dyes to work and inject them through my gel permeation chromatography instrument and get the exact molecular weight of it. <laughs> but that would be misuse of government funds, so we're not gonna do that. But I would be fascinated to look at all the different sizes. I want you to back up and say the name of that instrument again. <laughs> gel permeation chromatography. No, no, no. The Slow. Gel permeation chromatography. Really, what I, what I do is I'm a polymer chemist. So I look at uh, how aging mechanisms have in plastics. You know, we're surrounded by polymers in, in here. But what it pretty much does, it can do the size of a molecule. So whether it's a pharmaceutical or a dye molecule or a polymer molecule, it can give you the size. I was given a really big break early on by a, a, a dear, now a dear friend. Um, her name's Tiffany Smith. She owns Colorful Yarns in Centennial, Colorado in, in Denver. And she contacted me through Instagram very early on in, in my process and asked me if I wholesale. And at that point, I wasn't even sure exactly what that meant. <laughs> so she started ordering from me very early on, and it's grown from there where I've really not had to go looking for shops to carry my yarn. They've contacted me, which is kind of the beauty of, of social media. I have 12 different stockists around the country right now, um, everywhere from um, Portland, Oregon to Frederick, Maryland, um, I have a shop in Wisconsin, North Carolina. Uh, I'm forgetting people I know, but um, I'm in McKinney Knittery in McKinney, Texas, and Hill Country Weavers in Austin, West Seventh Wool in um, in Fort Worth. Those are my the closest ones, and then also Denver and Santa Fe as well. I was spinning my own yarn, and I don't hand spin all of that. That's a 
a big question that I get is, do I spin all of this? And the answer is no. <laughs> that would be more than I could keep up with, but I do I enjoy hand spinning. Um, and I had worked a little bit with some natural dyes with my hand spun yarn. Um, but once I decided I wanted to do this, I just kind of dove in and, and learned and um, used as many resources as I could to try to learn and develop my own techniques so I have my own voice in it. Just like any other artist with any other medium, you, you, take, uh, you take an already existing medium and make it your own and put your, your spin on it. Unfortunately, since I live in town, I can't have an alpaca or a sheep in my backyard, <laughs> but I, I can have an Angora rabbit. So yes, I have a, a, a let's see, she's a three-year-old satin Angora rabbit named Fern. Angora rabbits are, are bred specifically for their fiber production, and a, a mature Angora rabbit can produce somewhere around a pound of fiber a year. And if you think of a pound of cotton balls, that's a lot of fiber, you know. So um, even just one rabbit is, is a good fiber source. Um, she blows her coat usually about once every three months, so then you just kind of brush it out and collect it, and then when you have enough to spin, you, you spin it. She blows so her coat. That's what it's, that's the, that's the technical term for it, I guess. Um, they, she sheds. So just like um, dogs and other animals shed seasonally when the weather changes, things like that, um, angora rabbits tend to, to, um, to go through that process every, every 90 days or so. I got hooked with the spinning, bought my first spinning wall. I said, well, if I'm gonna spin, I want fiber animals. So I, I got a few angora rabbits. We have, we have two travel wheels. We have this one and this one's a travel wheel. This one is my favorite one to spin on. And then this one is what they call an art wheel. You get to design your own spinning wheel. And so I'm a big Lord of the Rings fan. And so that is our Lord of the Rings spinning wheel. It has one ring to rule them all. I just can't get it off right now. We've got the, the nine on the side that are trekking through and Gandalf's on the front. And I actually have my Hobbit house that actually lights up. So he does really fancy wheels. And I said, that was my birthday present to myself one year. Any colors you like to work with most? Turquoise, straight up, favorite color. <laughs> no, I don't have a favorite color. I do get, I do end up with certain color crushes season, you know, in different seasons. I'll be really into a, a, a certain color. What's your crush um, out of this collection? Oh, you can't ask in front of them. <laughs> what? Um, I, I don't have an absolute favorite. Um, uh, there are some, this is, this one's called Pink Cedar and it's, it's a new one for this fall and I, I have really been loving this. This one's called C. I've really been enjoying that one and using it quite a bit too. But then there are some that I kind of bring back in every collection because I love them still. So that's not a fair question. <laughs>